to God be the glory, my friends, and welcome to this, your real illuminating moment. I'm O.W. Prince. I'm old enough now to know what I like and know what I don't like. I don't need anyone telling me what to like and who to dislike. I also am old enough to know what makes sense and what doesn't make any sense. And it's always troubled me that in the Christian church, it was frowned upon when a man and a woman shacked together. I think that's what we called it. You call it cohabitating or living together, but we call it shacking up. Uh, living as husband and wife, but are not husband and wife having sex without the benefit of matrimony. We call that fornication. And the church and Christians frowned upon it, called it sin, condemned it, and condemned those who practice it. But then I look at what certain churches who I shall call apostolic, Pentecostal, evangelical, walk on water, holier than thou, full gospel, Ride in every storm churches. These churches, these super apostles, if you will, these super bishops, if you will, these super elders, if you will, uh, they say that divorcees aren't divorced, uh, but must return to their former spouses. And they say this without the benefit of civil matrimony. In other words, the two people who are now legally and morally divorced are now told by the preacher and the Christian church to come back together as husband and wife and cohabitate and copulate. My problem is, before they actually went through with a civil marriage, a civil contract, which is what a marriage is in this, in this society, you have to sign a contract. Um, in probate court or whatever civil authority that rules over the jurisdiction in which you reside. Um, and that authority then governs that marriage, not the church, not the pastor, not your denomination. And then that church comes in and usurps the authority of what has taken place in family court between two people who are now divorced and the church comes in and tell them, no, y'all not divorced, y'all come back together, and y'all can shack together, have sex together, and you don't have to go back through the marriage ceremony with the civil authority. And my thing is, if they don't have to go back through marriage with the proper legal papers and in the proper manner, because the church says so, then what was wrong with them shacking together before they got married? I'm just trying to make sense. Something ain't right there. And let me go a little bit further. As I used to say, let me go another further. If you were to examine Deuteronomy 24, I'm going to just summarize it for you, but I want you to look at it for yourself beginning at the very first part of that chapter. Deuteronomy 24 says that if a man marries a woman who becomes displeasing to him, this is the law that Moses gave for the sake of the hardness of their hearts. You remember that scripture in the New Testament. He said, Moses gave you this law for the hardness of your heart, but this is the law. He said, if a man marries a woman who becomes displeasing to him, that means for any reason, for any reason, and, and, and he gives her a certificate or writes her a bill of divorcement, which is called a get. And the way to remember that is get out. Uh, it's called a get. And he gives it to her and sends her out of his house. And after she leaves his house, she becomes the wife of another man. The second husband may dislike her and divorce her, but she cannot return to the first husband. That's an abomination. That's a vile and filthy thing in the eyesight of the Lord. But that's exactly what a lot of these apostolic Christian, Pentecostal, walk on water, evangelical, riding every storm churches are doing and practicing and causing their members to commit grave sin grave sin sin that is worthy of condemnation and the scriptures tell us that do not bring that kind of sin upon the land and the people of the Lord 
Now read it for yourself. It, it's in Deuteronomy 24. And, and, and a lot of people get confused because you got a lot of mistranslations. But nobody wants to speak out of the Holy Spirit, but I will. With the gift of the Holy Spirit, I now transliterate Matthew 5, around about the 32nd, uh, 33rd verses and, and thereabouts. You will see where the scripture tells us that whoever shall put away his wife, that is to divorce her, to do what Deuteronomy 24 suggests, to give her a bill of divorcement, a get, if you will, and, and, and cause her to leave out of his house. And, and they said that he must do so for the cause of fornication. In other words, that's the exception clause. Whoever shall put away his wife, except for the cause of fornication. In other words, that's the qualifier. It has to be for sexual filthiness. Let's just generalize that because a lot of people have gotten into semantics and been too particular about what is the particular sin that qualifies for fornication. And that's none of your business. Uh, God didn't um, enumerate on it, and you shouldn't either. So stop putting words and terms in the mouth of the Lord. He says, out of the Holy Spirit, fornication. Fornication also involves adultery and a whole lot of other sexual malfeasance, sin, vileness, and abomination. And if this man or anybody who's married finds fornication, uncleanliness in their spouse, it could be because they're not a virgin or because of their sexual proclivities or something that they want to do that's not normal, like anal sex or oral sex, that's reason for legitimate and moral divorcement. God is not going to shackle you with the thing that he condemns and judges to hell. He's not going to saddle his saints with such persons. In other words, if you are now, if you have legitimate cause to divorce, your divorce is then legitimate in the eyes of the Lord. But if it isn't, then the divorce is not morally just. And everybody involved in that separation, if they were to marry another, commits adultery. It said, for this cause, the Lord made a man and a woman that they might leave their father and mother and cleave to one another to become one flesh. So that there are no more two people, but now they are one person. And he puts it this way. What therefore God has joined, what therefore God has ordained, what, what therefore God has placed together and joined, let not man give a reason for divorcement or separation or for division or confusion or disruption. Man's in his civil authority or in his so-called Christian authority has no reason interfering with what God has put together. The marriage is God's institution, not the church's. The marriage is God's institution, not the church's. Let me say that one more time for those who are hard of hearing. Marriage is God's institution and not the church's, not the popes, not the bishops, not the elders, not one denomination, Protestant or Catholic, has authority in God's institution, no one but God. And if God's holy scriptures does not condemn it, you should neither. And it's not our business whether the cause is just. That's between the couple and God. But for the most part, we don't ever know what goes on between a husband and a wife or a former spouse and a divorcee. We don't really know. We weren't there and we can't tell it. Only God knows the truth. Amen? Keep your mouth out of other people's affairs and stop condemning every divorcee and every person that married someone who had a former spouse, as Deuteronomy 24 identifies as former spouse. If we were to learn these terms and apply them correctly, we would stop saying ignorant stuff like you got two wives or two husbands or three husbands. They may have two or three marriages but they only have one spouse. Because in this world and in this society, to have more than one spouse is called bigamy and is against the law. So stop lying on God and on people. I'm O.W. Prince.
And this has been your real illuminating moment. Thank you for musing with me. And as always in parting, many are the afflictions of the righteous and the Lord shall deliver him out of them all. Life hurts, but God heals. Keep looking up.